this season. And that's what we're going to talk a little bit about today, um, the many ways that uh, I believe God reveals and shows God's self to us in this season. Turn with me uh, for our lectionary sermon for today to Acts chapter number 17. And we're going to spend this time uh, really talking from the title of the sermon, The God I Never Knew. The God I Never Knew. This is a, a very, uh, in my mind, important uh, biblical text, particularly in this moment in time. Uh, it is uh, important for you and I to keep appreciating uh, that the God we serve is often beyond our capacity to fully understand or ascertain. But it is not the case that God is beyond our ability to know and to believe in. And, and so today we're going to uh, walk through this passage that has been gifted to us as a lectionary uh, passage and uh, give you a sense of how the early church was literally in the aftermath of Jesus' resurrection, working in a culture and a time where uh, there were other priorities. There were other uh, um, sources of, of wisdom and knowledge and information that were in, in, in many respects uh, not not uh, compatible or at least uh, fully integrated with the way in which this new life that Jesus had, had uh, proclaimed and, and brought uh, through his own experience and his own ministry was ushering into the world. And so the book of Acts uh, written by Luke uh, is in many respects a first century account of the first, uh, say, 30 years of Jesus' ministry, I'm sorry, of Paul and Peter and the apostles' ministry after Jesus was uh, resurrected. And so we find our real kind of uh, uh, tradition flowing out of the stories and the records and the acts of these apostles or disciples. And I just want to say to you that, that in this moment, there are acts, there are actions that you must do in this time, uh, and, and we want to imagine how can our actions, similar to those of the disciples, be a way for God to be made known uh, to both ourselves and to those around us. Is that all right? So here we go. We're going to uh, go to Acts chapter 17. We're going to start at verse number 16 and uh, I'm going to read this passage. It's, it's about 15 or so verses, uh, but it's an account of Paul. Uh, literally, he had just been ran out of a city uh, for being uh, too verbose about this new uh, uh, revelation of Jesus. And, and, and they, were, they were saying, man, this guy's coming. He's going to turn the world upside down. Let's get this guy out of here. And uh, literally, Paul left and he went to Athens. And so here we're picking up the story of Paul in Athens, um, making known the glory of God through the revelation of Jesus to a group of people who had not yet fully heard or understood uh, this revelation. Uh, Acts chapter 17, verse 16, uh, when you got it, let's just read along together. It should be on your screen as well. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was deeply distressed to see that the city was full of idols. Oh my, idols seem to show up in every era of human existence, right? So Paul argued in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and also in the marketplace. Every day he argued with those who happened to be there. Also, some Epicurean and Stoic philosophers debated with Paul. Some said, what does this babbler want to say? Others said, it seems or he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign divinities. This was because Paul was telling the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. So they took Paul and brought him to Areopagus and said to him, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? It sounds rather strange to us, so we would like to know what it means. Verse 21, now all the Athenians and the foreigners living there in Areopagus would spend their time in nothing but telling or hearing something new. It's important to appreciate that rhetoric. Rhetoric during this time was actually a huge part 
of the life of many folks who were learned during that time. That philosophy and, and, and the art of speaking, they would have debates and speeches in a public square uh, in an effort to convert one another to the most superior ideas of human life and civilization. It was not the sense that fundamentalism was reigning supreme, but there was a healthy mix of conversation, of argumentation, and of course, sometimes, you know, as human beings do, some of our arguments and conversations can, 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 can go left, you know, end up in a terrible uh, space and situation. But I want to just underscore that conversation, healthy dialogue with different perspectives is not the enemy of the truth. All right. Uh, I, I kind of got on a tangent there. Let me let me keep reading. Uh, so so verse number 22, uh, Paul stood in front of the Areopagus and said, Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I found among them an altar with the inscription to an unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The Lord God who made the world and everything in it, this God who is Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by human hands. Nor is this God served by human hands as though God needed anything since God gives to all mortals life and breath and all things. Woo, there's some good reading up in here, right? Verse 26, from one ancestor, God made all nations to inhabit the whole earth. And God allotted the times of their existence and the boundaries of the places where they would live so that they would search for God and perhaps grope for God and find God. Though indeed God is not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we too are God's offspring." And since we are God's offspring, we ought not to think that the deity is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of mortals. Verse 30, for while God has overlooked the times of human ignorance, now God commands all people everywhere to repent because God has fixed a day on which God will have the world judged in righteousness by one whom God has appointed. And of this, God has given assurance to all by raising him, Jesus, from the dead. When they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some scoffed. But others said, we will hear you again about this. And at that point, Paul left them. But some joined Paul and became believers including Dion Dionysus and Arapagite and a woman named Damaris and others with them. Oh, the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. I just want us to speak from the topic on today. Uh, simply the God I never knew. The God I never knew. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the word that has been read for us. The people of God, we ask you to hide this word in our hearts so we will not sin against you. And please allow the anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. May it rest upon me and even the hearers of your word. And we'll say thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of the way say amen. 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 The God I never knew. Now, what is so fascinating and important about this time and this season as we are uh, enduring and going through uh, the coronavirus, COVID-19, is to continue to hold the complexity of what we know, what we don't know, and what we can't know. 
Let me say that again. Uh, one of the greatest challenges that you and I will have in this season, uh, this season where it is literally a battle, a fight, a struggle for information. It is the struggle for what we know, what we don't know, and what we can't know. And this struggle then uh, requires all of us to begin to ask ourselves with great deference, with great soberness, and with great care, what then is our relationship to the unknown? The God that has revealed God's self only in glimpses though. Because the truth of the matter is, as much as you want to know about God and know all of God's ways and all of God's thoughts, the reality is, if God gave it to you all at once, <laughs> your head would just probably, you know, just, just implode, explode, pick one. Somebody say amen, right? That, that God is in God's essence so vast and so broad that God is, is unable to be fully known by us. Because God is infinite and we are finite. You get that? The infiniteness of God makes our finitude unable to fully grasp who God is. And yet God does not leave us without enough revelation for us to be able to make a discerned decision about the faithfulness and the faith to believe that which has been revealed. Now, in this biblical text, it's so important for you and I to appreciate that from times of our earliest existence as human beings, God has always been attempting to reveal God's self to us. I mean, in our, in our, our, our disciplines of both philosophy, theology, science, etc., cetera, uh, there are always these markers of what in uh, my uh, systematic theology class, we were taught general revelation and special revelation. And general revelation refers to the self-disclosure of God that all people can perceive by contemplating the evidence of God's presence in the world through nature and history and science and philosophy and human life in general. That you can find the glimpses of God Literally everywhere. I love Brother Lawrence and Teresa of Avila and some of these mystics, uh, uh, Ka uh, uh, Catherine and these folk who, who, who were able to, to encourage folks to see God in creation. I never forget when I was traveling uh, in, in Italy and I went to Assisi where uh, Francis of Assisi, who is the namesake for our current pope uh, of the uh, Roman Catholic Church. Uh, I got a chance to go to uh, Francis of Assisi's prayer garden. Woo, and it was, man, let me tell you, it was so amazing being in this prayer garden where Francis of Assisi uh, spent his time praying. He had built altars and, and prayer stations uh, next to trees, and, and they had these statues made in his honor that, that, that reflected his postures of prayer. He would pray so peacefully and powerfully that they said birds would come and settle in his hand as he prayed. They said that he would preach to the trees because all of creation needed to hear the good news of the redemptive, salvific power of Jesus Christ. That even in creation, you and I can see the intelligent design, as some would say. We would declare it is the presence of God at work, all right? And that this is known, this can be known to us through our disciplines, just that God is real. You ought to just, just, just comfort yourself that, that you can know enough about God's reality through what God has created. But then there's another kind of brand or, or realm of theological uh, discourse that talks about the revelation of God that must be special to us. And this unique self-revelation of God is 
is, is transferred or communicated to us through God's word and acts in the history of the people called Israel above all in Christ through the holy sacred texts that record this record and the church that has continued with both success and failure in a public witness capacity to preserve this thousands of years worth of special unique revelation. Now I want to start here because as we see in the biblical text, there is always this tension, as I stated, about what we know, what we don't know, and what we can know. And in the text, often the things that lead us to idolatry are the things that we would elevate above what we can know about God. And I want to just make a distinction here between idolatry and influence, because an, I, an idol will consume and even command your attention and focus more than God. In this text, we see as Paul is making his way through this city, there are many people who are, are worshiping idols. They have set up gods with a small g all through their city, and they are offering worship and adoration to these idols. Now, it's important to appreciate that in the, the, the Roman Empire, because they were an imperialist, uh, 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 genocidal, expansive empire that had a military outpost spread throughout a huge part of the known world, similar to our current country, but I'm not going to spend too much time on that. Amen. Uh-huh. But, 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 but just, just like in the Roman empire, uh, early, early, uh, uh, kind of religious sensibilities in the Roman empire made all of the Romans appreciate and offer worship to all of the gods of the nations they conquered. Meaning that when the Romans would conquer you, they would ask for your allegiance to the emperor, but allow you to preserve your worship to your God. And they would set up these idols in their cities to all of the gods. It was believed that if you only worshiped one God, and not all of the gods, you were a pagan. Think about that for a second, right? Because the, the monotheistic expression of Jewish religion that would uh, e emerge or, 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 or uh, 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 give birth to Christian faith, right, is a monotheistic sensibility. And so in the Roman Empire, their religious persecution was often because they would not subscribe to the idols that were around them. I hope you're catching this today because right now in our country, we have a problem with idols. We got a lot of idols. You ought to, you ought, I'm not going to ask you to put, put in the chat what your idol is, amen, because, you know, that may be a little bit too public for you. But I want you to at least acknowledge that there are idols that we have set up in this country, and they are bearing themselves for all of us to see. Idols of capitalistic uh, uh, and economic production that is predatory. Idols of race and gender, idols of human hierarchy, idols of, of, of force and violence, idols that are demanding our attention and focus more than God. I want to differentiate between an idol and an influence because an influence is that, as I would lift up for this sermon, that which can redirect your attention and focus but only so far. And influence is that which can inform, can supplement, can offer, hopefully, an addition to. The founder of our denomination, Bishop Robert Lawson, he would often in his messages say, add thou to it, right? Moving or taking it from a particular passage of scripture, add thou to it, that we are called to add to what we know. That which we can know, add to what we know, 
but always be humble about that which we don't or can't know. This is part of what I hope you and I can appreciate as we think through this idea of the unknown God that seeks to make God's self known to us. God wants you and I to be open to what God would teach us in the age of Corona. That you may have had a notion of God pre-Corona that you felt was altogether adequate and altogether sufficient. God bless you if you did, because my God uh, before Corona was, was stretching me just as much as I'm being stretched right now. Hey Amen. Do I have a witness up in here today that can say I, I've been getting stretched for quite a long time? Hey Amen. Corona's just stretching me just a little bit more. If you like me, sometimes I pray, God, I'm tired of being stretched. Can you just give a brother a time out? On this stretching thing, amen. It's all right. Just, 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 just put it in the chat and say, God, I need a timeout. I need a timeout. Well, well, in this particular text, we see that Paul is in fact in a city being Christian in such a way, a follower of Jesus in such a way that it captures the attention of all of those who are there. And in, 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 in a very phenomenal way, Paul's, Paul's preaching starts in a particular religious space. And it is so compelling that he then is moved to a more public space. As the scripture says, Paul was in their synagogues. Paul was in their marketplaces. Paul was in their schools. Paul was everywhere declaring the good news in a compelling way that it was helping fill in the blanks for those who were confident about what they knew, were curious about what they did not know, but were still very, very clear and humble about what they can't know. I just want you to know, child of God, that one of our postures as a Christian, as we go through this season, is to become much more clear about what we can know, what we don't know, and what we should know. And as we communicate in this moment, I want to offer our role as Christians. I, I love this uh, 10 things that Christians should say uh, often in this culture we live in. I'm going to give you these 10 things. I think it's on the slide. It, 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 uh, it says the first thing you ought to be able to say frequently, I'm sorry. That's right. You, you, just, you just, you know, fix your mouth, fix your lips, fix your ego to be able to say, I'm sorry. As a Christian with the power dynamics of our, of our, of our uh, tradition in this country, you ought to be able to say, I'm sorry. You ought to be able to say, how can I help? You ought to be able to say, I don't know. It's okay for you to say what you don't know because you don't know everything. Wish I could preach to somebody today. It's important for you to say, I could be wrong. It's important for you to ask questions, the opinions of others. What do you think? It's important for you to say frequently and often, I love you. Tell me more. That just sucks. Get comfortable getting into the, the, the pain space of others. Empathy, extending it. Uh, let's give it a try. And say nothing at all. Lord have mercy. Now, for some of us, all these ten things, we ought to just we ought to just just ask the Lord for another refilling of the Holy Ghost, because we 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 barely can say one, two, or three of them, much less all ten. But I do find that, particularly in this moment, you and I may need to ask God for the grace to be able to communicate differently, as God is revealing God's self to us, Paul. In Athens, in a space, a very pluralistic space where argumentation and rhetoric, the Stoics, the Epicureans, the, those who, who, who had high classical Greek thought, uh, places where folks from other uh, religious and philosophical traditions were converging for a deep and long and persistent debate about the highest quality and process of human life, Paul found himself plopped. Right in this space, some called it Mars Hill, the Areopagus, but this space was thought to have been a place where Socrates was killed 
500 years before for his presence of trying to argue some of his Socratic thoughts that were in many respects pushing up against the kind of fundamentalism of his day. Paul was able to engage people in ways of life outside of the church and the four walls of the institution. And in this time when there is too much focus on the building and not enough focused on the constitution of the church, the, 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 ecclesial, the ecclesial body of the church, this text is a wonderful gift to us because many of us may be uh, getting challenged to find our Mars Hill, find that place where we can make a bold both proclamation and a lifestyle declaration of what it means to make the life of Jesus known among us, appreciating first that God wants to make God's self known to us as well. So let me just give you a few things that I think uh, can help us in this process of meeting the God we never knew. The first thing that I find is that God reveals God's self to us through our wounds and our pain. Just, 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 just think about that. God reveals through our wounds and our pain. What I learn about God is often revealed to me by the wounds and the pain that I endure. I, I, I pulled this from our, our Psalms lectionary passage that Minister Wayne read so powerfully where he says, and or the, 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 the writer says, For you, O God, have tested us. You have tried us as silver is tried. That in the season of Corona, you and I are being tested and tried. We have very real wounds. We have very real pain. And the God pre-Corona was not able to handle the wounds and the pains of this season. I want you to know that God wants to show you who God is through the wounds and the tests and the pains we're going through today. That in many respects, God shows up in a powerful way in our sickness as a healer, in our trouble as a deliverer, in our loneliness as a companion. That God wants to make God's self known to you. Just like Paul in this public place, notice that they all had these idols or these other tributes to the gods they knew. Paul, looking at all of their particular tributes, found their ode to an unknown God because they were afraid in this space to not have something dedicated to what they did not know. All oh, the Epicureans, the Stoics, the Romans, they built an altar to the unknown God because they wanted to make sure that just in case all the other gods who were being worshipped uh, were not God, they wanted to make sure that there was an altar to the unknown God to cover all their bases. At least you got to give them credit for being thorough. Amen. That, that they want to make sure that everybody was represented. Paul took advantage of this altar to an unknown God and began to make God known to them. And I'm here to tell you that there are some places in your life right now that are unknown to you, but they are not unknown to God. And God wants to make God's self known to you. Oh, C.S. Lewis, he says it like this, that we can ignore even pleasure, but pain insists upon being attended to, uh, and, and God whispers to us in our pleasures. God speaks to us in our conscience, but God shouts to us in our pains. It is the megaphone for God to rouse a deaf world. God in the painful 
and wounded places of your life that you have not yet given fully to God, that is, I want to suggest to you, the altar of the unknown God in your heart. This virus has brought so much pain up for us that we must be honest and say, God, there are some places in my life where I have an altar to an unknown God. I just don't know if you can handle this thing that concerns me. And I want you to be of good cheer because just like Paul showed up with a wonderful description, I want you to know there are those who can show up in your life and help make known God to you in those unknown, unaddressed, hidden places of your life. So the first question, how are you encountering the unknown God in the age of coronavirus? Are your wounds and pains openings or closing doors of knowledge about God in this season? I want you to appreciate, loved one, that we have a choice of how we will allow this moment, this season of pain and challenge, of tumult and difficulty to, to, to be addressed as relates to the knowledge we have or don't have about God. Part of why we want us to engage in small groups and, and belong circles and Bible studies and we're, we're launching a, a brand new phone tree process where every two weeks we hope you get at least one touch from a leader from our congregation. We want to be in touch with you because dare we say some of us may help be that person to help make God known to you. In this season, we all need a Paul or a, a, a Dorcas or, or a Mary or, or, or a Peter or, or a human being in our life who can help make God known to us when the clutter of our own lives keep God hidden from us. Second thing that I want us to think about in this moment is that God is often unknown to us but can be known through science and philosophy. Yes, 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 yes. God can be known through science and philosophy. Verse 24, the God who made the world and everything. Somebody say everything. Everything in it. I want you to know that there is no discipline, no philosophy, no thought in the world that is greater or did not emanate from the all-knowing source of the almighty, eternal, uncreated one. That science and philosophy are not enemies of God's truth. Paul, in this passage, he used Epicurean, Stoic, and Bedean ideas to introduce the unknown God to the Mars Hill audience. And not all of them believed. But listen, some of them did. I love in the passage as it lists those who did believe at the end. Dionysus, uh, the Arapagi, uh, uh, and a woman named Demarius. Think about the significance of the woman being named along with the brother, an Arapagi, who believed what they pre was presented by Paul. Paul used science, philosophy, theology, his own experience, put it together and demonstrated such a compelling presentation that both men and women alike, women who were in this society even uh, considered less than human, less than a man, was named as a significant part of one, those who accepted what Paul presented. I want you to know, child of God, in this moment, we are dealing with a challenging anti-intellectual movement that is, is spiraling through, through Christian faith. People are believing that their opinions are just as credible as things that are credibly proven to be true. 
Now, I'm not one of these people who believes that we must imbibe everything we hear without some form of suspicion and skepticism. We ought to try every form of knowledge. Try it, meaning, meaning put it on trial, not try it like, you know, <laughs> you know, I'm just trying, you know. No, put it on trial. You ought to discern it. Just like Paul was able to take and use the disciplines of science philosophy of his day to help make God known, so must you and I in this crisis moment not be afraid of science and philosophy and the wisdoms of, of humanity that when put in conversation with the Almighty give us a fuller picture of what it means to be faithful. But we are in a moment where too many Christians are falling victim to conspiracy theories peddled by an administration that we all know has an anti-intellectual strain all through it. Before this crisis, this administration headed by uh, I won't call him the father of all liars because that's the, that's the devil. But he's got to at least be the cousin of all liars. <laughs> amen. He, he at least got to be related to the man. Somebody say amen, right? Amen. That we know that this president lies thousands of times without any effort. We know that he disputes what we know to be true about, about the value of black and brown bodies, the value of, of non-Christian uh, 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 religious people, the value of undocumented folks. We know he's lying about that. We know he lies about his taxes and his personal worth. We know that he does not tell the truth. As a matter of fact, he has been able to mainstream the idea of fake news and now has people who don't even agree with his political views believing that credible news is fake news. And in a pandemic, conspiracy theories are lethal to those who don't have full access to information, to those who do not have the, the luxury of reading long articles and journals and books and testing them with credible, uh, educated, and, and, and people in the know. Can you imagine how hard it is for Pookie on the street to be able to talk or meet a doctor and ask the doctor about the, the real reality of the coronavirus so instead he will look on YouTube or Facebook and see what his favorite rapper or preacher or philosopher or hotep is saying and build his life on faulty sand. And that is why I and others are so committed to correcting lies in the public space when they are given in the public space. There's an article in the Christianity Today that talks about Christians uh, being too gullible. It actually says that gullibility is not a spiritual gift. Lord, I, when, when I, almost, I almost made that the title of my sermon today. Amen. But I didn't want to just rob their whole top line. <laughs> but I want you to know, gullibility is not a spiritual gift. You and I are told by Jesus to buy the truth and do not sell it. Just tell your neighbor, tell the chat room, don't you be no sellout. Don't you sell the truth of what we know. We can know some things. And what you don't know, you must then make special care to find the information that is within your grasp. I got this wonderful, wonderful uh, 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 a meme that I, I found that I cut it up and put it on, on our screen because uh, it talks about spotting bad science. Lord, I got to get done here. Amen. I'm just going on and on. But, but it talks about spotting bad signs. And I just want to put it up. I want you to take a picture of this, a screenshot. And I want you to appreciate that there are processes and ways that you and I can discern if what we are hearing and reading and, and what is being presented is indeed reputable. Some of these, these, these ways, it's 10 things, 12 things to spot, bad science, sensationalized headlines, many of the things you're reading on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, on Snapchat, on, 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 on TikTok, on, 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 you know, I don't know, uh, uh, your, your crazy sources, it's clickbait. 
It's clickbait. People are boosting. They're paying money to make sure these ads pop up on your feed. And when you click on them, you get more of the same misinformation. Sensationalized headlines. Number two, misinterpreted results. Number three, conflicts of interest. Number four, correlation and causation. Some of these words you don't even understand. I want you to know something. If you don't understand something, don't build your life on those who have shown themselves to not be credible. Unsupported conclusions, problems with sample size. Number seven, unrepresentative samples used. No control group, no blind test. Number 10, selective reporting of data. Number 11, unreplicable results. Number 12, non-peered reviewed material. All of this is what makes science more reliable than your 10 minute, you know, a 10 minute uh, watching of a YouTube video. I can't tell you how many people who think they know more than doctors than th because they saw a video. I'm here to tell you, Paul would not have been able to make a convincing case about the unknown God if Paul had not attended himself to study, to show himself approved unto God. A person who is able to rightly divide the word of truth and you and and I must make sure in this moment that we are doing everything we can to not pit science and philosophy against the truth of God's word. Together they complement and they give us a wonderful picture of our highest acts of faithfulness. Uh, oh, you ought to tell your neighbor they're not the enemy, uh, but they can be companions. Uh, you wouldn't trust an untrained uh, mechanic with your car, uh, nor would you trust an untrained doctor with your heart. Uh, you wouldn't trust an untrained teacher with your child. Uh, but some of us would trust an untrained thinker, uh, an untrained president uh, with your life. No, the devil is a lie. Uh, I refuse to allow myself to be swept up into the misinformation that does not make God known the life of God the peace of God the wisdom of God we must make God known through our knowledge and through the truths as we discern them with great care Lord I feel like preaching on this thing for a little while uh, can you just ask your neighbor in the chat uh, or dare I you say ask yourself can you see the wisdom of God in the knowledge uh, and disciplines of science and philosophy uh, can you can you resist allowing these things to be pitted against one another in this time uh, I want you to be suspicious but I want you to also remain curious uh, don't fall into paranoia that leads to fear uh, that creates irrationality uh, no in this moment child of God uh, it's important for you and I to say I I will uh, chase and pursue knowledge. Uh, I will uh, ask God and the pastors uh, and the spiritual leaders and the doctors that I know for discernment. Uh, but I won't chase a rabbit down a hole uh, when I don't know the rabbit for myself. Uh, nor do I know the hole that the rabbit is falling into. Uh, the devil is a lie. Uh, I will be somebody uh, who will depend uh, that God God will make God's self known to me. Shout hallelujah. And then the last thing. Oh, I didn't think I was going to preach like this today. Is that God makes God's self known through divine revelation. Somebody holler divine revelation. Verse number 33 says that what you worship as the unknown. This I proclaim to you. God said, you may not know me yet, but just hang around a little while because I'm getting ready to send you somebody that can make me known to you. At the nation says it like this, that we cannot know God for God's essence is unknowable, but that God is known to us through the acts of 
of his hand. For his actions, they reveal God's self. As God reaches down to us, the old Jewish folk in the Israel nation, they didn't call God by God's given name because they did not dare utter his name because they knew that this God, he was unknowable. He was ineffable. So they made up some names based off of what God did for them. They called him Jehovah Jireh because he will provide. They called him Jehovah Rapha because he would heal their bodies. They called him Jehovah Shammah because he was always present. They called him Jehovah Shalom because he was their peace. They called him Jehovah Nisi because he is their banner. They called him Jehovah Raha because he was their shepherd. They called him Jehovah Sikanu because he was their righteousness and their justice. But down through the years, folk got tired of calling him all those names. So before the foundations of the world, God sent Jesus, his only begotten son. They hung him high and they stretched him wide. He hung his head for me he died that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow every tongue shall confess to the glory of God the Father that he he is Lord I stop by to tell you that God can be known even in this age you can know God for yourself and just in case you don't know what to call God I heard the old saints say that every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before every day with Jesus I love him more and more he's the one that saved and keeps me he's the one that I adore every day every day every day with Jesus I love him I serve him I worship him. I adore him. I obey him. He is the God that has made himself known to us. Shout hallelujah. Every day with Jesus. I want you to know that you can find Jesus in this corona season by just looking for him. Jesus will pop up. He'll pop up in your pleasures. He'll pop up in your pains. He'll pop up in your questions. He'll pop up in your answers. He'll pop up in science and philosophy, your inquiry, your curiosity. Jesus will be there with you. I know for some of us, Jesus over-associated with the Western imperialistic project of colonial colonization. That's not the Jesus that is known as the God of history. That's a human construction of Jesus that deserves to be deconstructed. But I want you to know that this same Jesus that God raised from the dead, the spirit can find you right where you are. He can find you in your Mars Hill moment. The Spirit can make God known to you and I. And so my prayer for us today, God, make yourself known. Make yourself known to me. Make yourself known to my community, to my church, to my loved ones, to my family. Make yourself known through my pleasures and my pains. Through this coronavirus, make yourself known. Make yourself known by truth and wisdom standing up to neutralize and counteract the lies and the misinformation 
of the gullible or the maniacal. Make yourself known, God. So we as a people who love you and who want to experience your faithfulness, God, may we come out of this season stronger and better. Some says, never would have made it. Never would have made it. Come on, let's just take a moment and pray. God, I pray right now for the people who are going through this season and you're not known to them. They may know you, God, as Jehovah Jireh, but they don't yet know you as Jehovah Sikanu. They may know you as Jehovah Nisi, but they don't know you as Jehovah Shama. God, I pray in the name of Jesus that the altar to the unknown gods that are erected in our lives, God, make yourself known to us. Send along someone, something, a catalyst, Lord God, to connect the dots of my pain and my wounds with the dots of knowable discipline, science, and philosophy, and then the supernatural revelation that comes from the Spirit and your Word. May they all, Lord God, pray together in a way that makes it easy, less difficult to say, I know Jesus for myself. God, in this time when evil seems to be winning, God, I pray that you will make yourself known to us when ignorance and foolishness seems to abound. Make yourself known to us where pain and transitions and wounds proliferate. Make yourself known to us, God. Let us not go through this season in an unknowable place or posture of you. And I believe, God, just like you've done in times past, you'll do it today. You'll make us able to grasp the revelatory knowledge that is both general in creation around us and special through the revelation of Jesus' work on the cross and in resurrection. We'll say thank you, God, for making yourself known. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless you, people of the way. God bless you, people of the way. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. We love you with the love of the Lord. Amen. I pray today that this whole time of worship was a blessing to you. Listen, as we are endeavoring to stay connected and stay in ministry with all of you, I'm asking you, please go to our website. Fill out a connection card if you're not a member. If you want to give your life to Jesus, certainly I hope you did it during our time of prayer, but you need someone to follow up with you, let us know. Fill out that connection card. Uh, like our pages on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, and on YouTube as we try to keep pushing all of the content we can to make sure that we stay nourished in the spirit and wise in the wisdom we need to make it through this time. Certainly on behalf of myself, Amen. Our family, our church, ministry team, we love you with the love of the Lord. Stay strong, stay safe, stay at home, but more than anything, stay solid and in search of the knowledge of God. God bless you, everyone. We'll see you next week.